I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorm, Maine, and greetings from Hancock Pond in West Sebago, Maine. I'm on vacation, but as we know, YouTube never takes a vacation. So until I catch my limit, let's watch some of my favorite videos from the archives. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the show. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorham, Maine. This is a really nice antique mirror frame, Queen Anne style. It's probably from uh, before 1750. It's a period antique. Uh, it fell from the wall and sort of broke apart, but not bad. It broke into joints. They must have been loose already. Uh, we have the moldings that came off. Uh, we have the back, which is the original back and a nice piece of old glass. Uh, it's made of walnut and it's actually, uh, except for the obvious things that have happened to it, it's in really good shape. So I need to re-glue the frame and glue the moldings back on again. So one of the first things I need to do here is take this apart. Uh, this is coming apart. You can see these old nails here. I want to try to keep those nails. I also see evidence of uh, what appears to be a spline. So I've got to work these other joints apart and figure out exactly what I've got. step will be to remove the new nails that are here. I think there's just a few in these top joints. Now I'm going to uh, scrape as much as I can. I'm going to scrape around the old nails, see what glue I can get off of there. I've scraped uh, as much glue as I can, did pretty good. Now I'm going to glue it back together. I've left the original nails in place and I'm going to use those to guide these back together. I'm going to start the assembly when I get them close, then I'll put the glue in there and I'll clamp it together. If you remember there's uh, these little splines here just in the bottom of the frame. I'm not going to attempt to replace those, they're really small. They did the spline then veneered over the edge so uh, that would be a problem. I don't think they do much good. When I'm, after the glue up, I'm going to add some support to the uh, outside corners here. Okay, that was a that was a tough glue up. Uh, clamps get in the way of each other. I also had to make sure this is square. It's uh, it's really square. It's good. Uh, all the joints are together, so I think I'm good. Okay, I've let this uh, set up overnight. All right, this seems uh, it seems nice and strong, um, and it's and it's nice and flat. So it's great. I think the next thing I want to do 
I'm going to glue some uh, very thin uh, braces on the exterior of these corners uh, just to give it a little strength because the back when I go to put the back on that sits inside the frame the back doesn't really help this frame so I feel the need to put something across here it'll just be some superficial thin pieces of wood in the corners so I've got some uh, eighth inch maple scrap I'll use to cut these little uh, corner pieces so the theory is is that these little triangles will give some support to this frame but they're just superficial if anybody ever wanted to take them off in the future, they could. Uh, before I start gluing on these, uh, these moldings on the other side, I, I should have done this when I had it apart, but I want to remove uh, there's little blocks of wood that held in the glass and nails that held in the wooden back, and I'm going to re remove those right now. Alright, now I can uh, start, I have all these pieces which came off, i to figure out where they go, and then I can uh, scrape the old glue off and glue them down. Now you may have noticed uh, on the molding on the frame that there's a lot of sections with spaces between the sections, sections like these. And that's because the grain of the molding runs perpendicular to the grain of the frame. The molding has shrunk up, leaving all these spaces. So as I glue these pieces back, you'll notice that I'm going to leave spaces on either side, just like it was you know, before these came off. So everything looks good. Uh, now I'm going to take a, a damp rag and just uh, go over the frame uh, looking for any uh, hide glue that uh, needs to be cleaned off. Okay, before I go uh, any further on the frame, I'm going to turn it over and install the glass and the back. As I uh, turn this over, I realize there are some support pieces uh, glued to the back of this upper section that were missing when it came in. But I need to find some uh, thin strips of wood and uh, strips of wood that can bend a little bit with this cupped top section and uh, glue those on. I realized too when I turn this over that I had this little piece of wood taped to the back and it came from this corner right here. You know, when the wood, this edge is veneered, and when the wood, when the frame itself shrunk some, it pushed this area out, and that came off. But I think I can, I think I can get it right back there where it came from. All right, I found some nice pieces of uh, eight, eighth inch pine in the scrap wood box and I've cut them to fit in these three spaces. So I'll just uh, scrape the old glue and glue them down.
So I've still got to put some uh, stain on my new pieces, but first, uh, I've talked it over with the owner of the mirror and uh, all these uh, cracks between these sections of molding. I'm going to uh, fill those with a little wax. Uh, it's called low heat burning stick. It's just a hard wax that you melt into these cracks. The cracks look good. Uh, the wax I used is a pretty good neutral color as I, as I hold this up and kind of look at it though. I see some places where the wax looks a little light so I'll use a, a, a fine grain marker like this one to touch them up a bit just in some areas. This is the original piece of glass or not. It's certainly very old. Silvering looks very old. But I think the original glass might have been a lot thinner than this piece. This is kind of a heavy piece of glass, but I don't know that much about it. So there we have it. This is a really nice 18th century Queen Anne looking glass. And uh, of course it fell off the wall because the old wire in the back broke. So I re-glued the frame and re-glued re a lot of these pieces of molding around the perimeter of the glass. I think it looks pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson, Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorham, Maine. This is a really nice chair, one of a set. Uh, we always call them gondola chairs. It's from the early 19th century, 
it's definitely uh, European, but I don't know what country. You know, if it was if it was English, it might be a Regency chair. If it was French, it might be First Empire. Uh, light wood like this was frequently used more in the middle of the continent, in Germany, uh, Austria, Switzerland. Uh, I'm not sure where it's from. It has straight front legs, but it does have the saber legs in the back. All that's wrong with this chair is what is obvious, which is that this is popped loose, probably from people picking up the chair like that, and it's popped loose from down here. So I've got to clean those up and re-glue them. The first thing I want to do here is, I thought I saw a little bit of looseness in this joint also. So I'm going to tap this a little bit, see if it wants to come up. Seeing a little bit of movement there, a little bit of widening of the joint. I don't want to push my luck though. So at this point, maybe I'll just work a little glue in there. And maybe when I lift this up a little bit more, it, it might help to loosen that now that I've shocked it a little bit. Alright, now I'll try to uh, scrape these as much as I can. See if I can get all this old glue off of here. This stuff's pretty hard. I think I'll apply some uh, very low heat to it. See if it loosens up a little bit. You might notice that I'm uh, watching the clock while I do this. So I'm going to hold this heat on here for a full two minutes. This is really low heat, but I'm not even going to poke at it till after two minutes goes by. If that doesn't seem to do the trick, I'll move it to the next level of heat. Good. The low heat's uh, doing it. And I'm just taking my time with the low heat because I really don't want to do any damage to this finish. So if I take my time now, it'll really pay off later. See, this is a piece of wood, a chip here, that also goes to the front of this I'd seen before. I want to get the glue off of it. I don't want to disconnect that piece of wood if I can help it. Well, as you can see, it's separated anyway. And that's okay. It's all clean wood. I'll get it right back where it belongs. And now actually it's a little bit easier to separate this other chip. In fact, maybe I don't need to separate that one all the way. It seems like it wants to go right back where it belongs. Okay, so now I've got to clean out this mortised area where the back splat goes. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, dirt and glue or whatever down in there. I don't necessarily need to clean it all out, but I need to make sure that nothing restricts this when I bring it back down. Now, I already uh, dry clamped this, so I got my clamps all ready. Now, I'm using a hide glue here. I'll let that dry overnight. The high glue will uh, come off with water, but this isn't uh, giving up very easily. I think I need to be uh, a little more aggressive with a scrubby pad and some hot water. So this area, the, the, and the piece is glued down really flat, uh, everything isn't perfectly smooth, but I'm not going to sand it. I'm going to burn in wax stick 
into all the imperfections, uh, smooth it out, and then polish it. You know, nothing else is perfect on a chair. I'm not going to start sanding this area and change the color of the wood. So there we go, a sweet little uh, antique gondola chair. Uh, all it needed was a, a little repair work and some re-gluing. I think it looks pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson, Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorham, Maine. This is a nice little uh, mahogany drop leaf table. It's not an antique. Uh, it, uh, the word gate leg refers to the fact that you know, this is a drop leaf table. And the support system uh, resembles a gate, I suppose. It appears to be a solid mahogany. I think even the legs are mahogany. And this table is a mess. I don't know what's happened to it. Uh, it's obviously been left in some weather and greatly abused. It clearly needs to be refinished, but I don't want it to look like a brand new table. I hope to keep it looking old. So what I intend to do is I'm going to wash this down with acetone as best I can. I think all this will come off. It doesn't have much finish on it. I'll sand it lightly, and then I'll treat it with oxalic acid see if it gets the stains and the black marks out and then I'll just finish it. The first step as always is to uh, remove the leaves. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'll remove the base also. That way I'll be able to see if it needs to be re-glued. It'll be easier to work on. All right, I've got uh, acetone and uh, number one steel wool. It's great to uh, watch this mahogany come to life as I scrub off with the acetone. Now, note that I'm, I'm always going with the grain. I'm hoping to really do a minimal amount of sanding on this. So even with the steel wool, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to go with the grain and go very carefully. So I'm going to go over this again with clean acetone. In the meantime, when you're doing something like this, you inevitably are going to get uh, some drips and runs on the bottom, uh, even little drips uh, around the edge here. So you've got to do the bottom too. You can't be having uh, drips, fingerprints, stain, and stuff on the bottom of it. I'm really seeing a lot of color variations on the bottom of the sleeve. 
this area here I suspect might be the original color. And uh, I'm just not sure what's going to happen with these big variations on the top. Okay, the base is done. Now I'm going to uh, sand the three sections of the top uh, just with 150 and by hand uh, prior to giving it a treatment of oxalic acid. I've sanded up all three sections now and so I will uh, mix up a little oxalic acid and put it on and see if it helps with the color. So I've let this all dry for a day or two. The tops look, they look great when they were wet. There's still color variation, but uh, whereas normally you might worry about that or try to do something about it, and I'm not. Uh, we decided in the beginning I was going to clean this off, lightly sand it, exolic it. I'm going to sand it again with some 220, and uh, then we'll put the first coat on. The uh, sandpaper uh, continues to clog up rapidly, uh, probably because I didn't use stripper on this. It must still have a lot of residue of the finish that was on here, but I'm just going <clears> to <throat> deal with it and keep going. coat, I'm going to seal this with shellac. I anticipate uh, that there may be problems with this finish. In other words, I, we know that the top has got some kind of gunk in it that turns up on the sandpaper. Uh, different contaminants can cause problems with uh, surface tension, which makes the finish not flow out smoothly, craters and stuff. So uh, sometimes a coat of shellac might help. The wood looks great. This one board is an incredibly beautiful board. It's too bad the rest of them aren't. There's different things that you could do to try to mitigate the difference between these boards, but uh, it's not my intention to try any of them. This leaf is better. I mean, still, it's all dark down at this end, but uh, it looks good. This is the center section of the table. You know, the leaves are uh, made of uh, pretty nice wood. Uh, decent width boards. It's odd the top. The center section is made up of four different boards with really random uh, different types of grain. So I'll let these dry overnight. I'm not going to shellac the base, so I'm going to wait uh, when I put the first coat of tunnel oil varnish on this. I'll do the base at that time. Well, I've let these dry actually for a few days, and so now I'm going to sand them uh, with 320 gold. Okay, all three pieces of the top are sanded. So the next step is I'm going to go over these tops with this product uh, called uh, Wax Wash Remover. 
uh, it's just some blend of solvents that will remove oil or other contaminants, hopefully, from the surface. Uh, you could also use uh, paint thinner or even water with uh, ammonia or Dawn detergent in it. What I'll do is I'll, I've taken an industrial paper towel, I'll dampen it with the wax wash remover, go one swipe, turn the pad, another swipe, fold it. In other words, never go back over the same surface. We don't want to spread contaminants around. I want to take them off. So now I'm ready to apply the first coat of varnish. I use this uh, tongue oil varnish. It's very thin. I like it. I like the way it flows out. Okay, the tops are done, and now I can put the uh, first coat on the base. Okay, the base looks great. Um, so that's it for today. Now I can just. Uh, let everything dry overnight. Okay, these have dried actually for a couple days now. Doesn't look too bad. There's areas that have soaked in more than others, and uh, there's some clunkiness going on here. I'm going to sand it with uh, 320. <clears throat> Not too much. Let's see what it looks like. This center section uh, dried very unevenly, very strangely. I'll just sand it as much as I can. This uh, top is proving to be very difficult to sand. All those little, I guess they're like blisters, the finish didn't really dry. It's clogging up the sandpaper. I found using a block is helping. I'm also uh, using a little bit of 220 first and then the 320. And, uh, I'm just going to stand it as uh, well as I can. I don't want to cut through if I can help it. Now I'll go over it with a uh, new gray pad. Okay, I'm going to do two more things before I brush on the next coat. First, I'm going to wipe it off again with the uh, wax wash remover, just like I did before this coat. I'm going to wear uh, new gloves while I'm waiting for the wash wax removal to dry, I'm going to mix up some ammonia and water. Alright, this is a similar idea to the wax wash solvent. I'm going to wet the surface down. And I'll squeegee it off. Alright, these dry pretty quickly. While I'm waiting, I'll get my varnish ready. This finish is uh, fish iron, uh, cratering <clears throat> right here as I brush it. But I'm just going to keep tipping it off. Seems to be getting better. I'm going to keep proceeding. It's actually uh, not looking too bad as I just kept tipping it off. I just, uh, and we'll see what it's like tomorrow, I just want it to get enough film on there so I can sand it smooth. This center section was by far the worst, and it's just shining like crazy right before my eyes, but as I continue to brush it, just gently tipping it off, it seems to help. So I've just uh, stood here for about five mon minutes, continually tipping it off, and it, it really looks not bad. Far from perfect, but we'll see tomorrow. Well, this is dried overnight. 
It's a real mess. It, uh, I did keep the heat up last night. It's dried fine. But, uh, and it is better than last time. I will say that. But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to sand it again with 220. Try to sand it level without going through. Then I'm going to wash it again with the same way I did last time. So I did it as uh, much as I could with the block. It's going well. Used a lot of expensive sandpaper. After the 220, I'm going over it by hand with 320. Seems to be helping a lot in those last little spots. Still clogs up. And then I'm going to go over it with a gray pad really well. See if I can really even out all the little bit of unevenness I can still see there. All right, the, uh, the gray pad really evened it out. It looks good now. I know I cut through in a couple of places, but not too many. So now I'll wash it off with the wax wash again. By the way, it took me about maybe 45 minutes to sand this and get it all ready. I still have to do the leaves, but they're not nearly as bad as this top. This top, the leaves look great. I mean, they're not perfect, but they're a lot better. Now, this is what I'm going to do differently. I'm not going to brush on a coat like I did before. I'm going to pad on a coat. This is looking okay. It's, uh, it's not great, but it's not fish eyeing and everything. Also, I'm trying to leave a, a spare amount on. I think I'll have to do this uh, at least a couple more times. But at least I'm getting some finish down on here. I think it's going to work. The, uh, the leaves are sanding up uh, easier than the center section, which is nice. Uh, they're not nearly as bad. And in the areas where the finish is smooth, it actually sands up with a minimal amount of the uh, clogging sandpaper. All right, now I'll give the uh, leaves uh, the same treatment with the uh, wax wash remover as I did on the center section, and then I'll pad some finish on them. Okay, so now I'm going to pad a coat on these two leaves, and then I'll do another coat on that center section. So I put the tongue oil varnish in a little squeeze bottle to make this padding process easier. From my vantage point, looking down, it's, it looks really good. I'm trying to put on a fair amount of finish. I'm trying to put on as much finish as I can. What happens is it, it looks great as I'm looking down on it like this, which is fine. Uh, as it dries, it's drying a little streaky. Uh, I'm not too worried about it. I'm going to pat it again. I'm just trying to build up enough finish where then I can like, steal wool it and wax it. As I get more and more coats built up, and if I, when I think I'm near the end of the process, I'll try to put it on a little more sparingly just to help avoid any streakiness. All right, this is the second coat for the center section. All right, wait till tomorrow and try again. Okay, this coat has dried for 24 hours. It, it looks all right. I mean, when it, when it was wet, it looked great. When it dried, it you know, went back a little bit. But, but at least it has no more of that uh, weird stuff with the contamination. So I'm just, I don't need to sand it. I'm just going to pat on another coat. I've got to build up some finish. This time I'm trying to lay down a lot more of the finish. Now that I know that this padding technique uh, seems to help keep that problem from coming back, now I need to get enough finish on here that I can rub it out. Alright, I'll keep the heat up. It's, we're in a little cool spell here, and uh, see how it looks tomorrow. The tops keep looking better. Uh, these have dried for about uh, four hours and they seem really dry. I'm going to put another coat on. And this time <clears throat> I'm going to use the satin because I'm hoping that this is the final coat. 
this coat uh, is interesting. This is, I'm keeping this pad really, really tight like this. And this coat seems to be going down uh, almost streak free. It looks really good. It has a nice, uh, has a, definitely has a lower sheen. All right, I'll let this dry overnight this time and uh, see what it looks like tomorrow. All right, these uh, tops have dried overnight. They look all right, especially this one. It still has a little bit of uh, texture to it from the problem I was having. But I'm going to go over it with wax and steel wool. I think it's going to look fine. I'm just applying, uh, you know, trying to keep a flat hand, applying a, a light, even pressure. I don't want the steel wool to necessarily cut into this finish. I want it to remove any nits, and it's doing that fine. And uh, I'm hoping it'll just kind of even it out a bit. But I'm real happy with the uh, way this is waxed up. The uh, streakiness is gone. Uh, coat looks beautiful. And now I'll do the leaves. Okay, I'll, uh, now. now I can assemble it. So there we go, this uh, nice little mahogany gate leg table. Uh, if you remember, this table had a lot of problems, uh, some environmental. In other words, remember what a mess the top was. And uh, some are inherent to the piece. And I'm speaking of the mismatched boards. In order to solve the problem of the mismatched boards, I would have had to stain it very dark mahogany, which was probably what it was originally. And that would have uh, given it a factory-like finish and eliminated all the character that it's gained over the years. Uh, we stuck to the plan, just cleaned it down, gave it an oil and wax finish. It is what it is, and I think it looks pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson, Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorm, Maine. This is a nice little uh, 20th century fall front desk. I'm not going to restore this piece, but the owners have asked me to replace this missing foot. So what I want to do here is I want to cut into this leg to glue a new piece of wood onto here. I need it to be a really good glue joint, so I'm going to cut this with a router. So what I intend to do is uh, sort of turn this desk at a 45 degree angle over here on the floor and clamp it to the bench with the leg over the bench. And then I'll use some blocks of wood to build up a little platforms on either side so that I can put a template. This is just a template, one of many that I have, different sizes. So I can put a template over it onto which the router can ride to make the cut.
I've, uh, I've got a good surface now on which to glue a new piece of wood. I've done some uh, rough measurements on the other leg, and I really only need a piece uh, about less than three inches long. I've got a nice big uh, cherry cut off here. I'm going to cut a piece out of this. Uh, I'd say it's going to be you know, about two inches wide and three inches long. All right, I've got this uh, basic block of wood. I think I'm going to take the desk, um, unclamp it from this bench, move it to a, a better location, and I think I'm going to dry clamp this into place and shape it as much as I can before I glue it. So this is a tough part. Um, I think that the first thing I need, I need some sort of point of reference. I think the first thing I've got to do is establish where the bottom of this piece is and cut it. So I think I'll stand this up on the bench and determine where the bottom of this foot is. So I, uh, I hung some clamps off the back of this thing and <clears throat> put some weight on that end. And then I can take a straight edge So now, I'm, I think I'm going to turn this desk upside down because I also need to establish, you know, the center point of this pad on my new piece. So now I'm going to take measurements from these legs and draw arcs in the new piece and where those arcs intersect should be my pad here. I thought I was being so smart, but my three lines don't uh, intersect, so I'm going to run through this exercise again. Uh, actually, I think I'll make myself a cup of tea and uh, ponder this a little while. So, off camera, I made a new block of wood. It really didn't take long since I had all those pieces out uh, because I was afraid that the piece I cut might have been a little too short out this end. I checked the legs. I re-glued one of these legs that seemed a little loose. I made my measurements again. They still don't meet up. So, what I've done is, using my marks as reference and also just eyeballing a 45 line across this block, of, you know, a 45 with this leg. I've just decided the best spot. It could be that the, maybe the legs are slightly different from each other. Uh, they certainly appear to be pretty much the same. I think maybe one of them I see here goes in a little bit further. Uh, so. I've just made my best shot here, and I'm going to go with that as my center point for this pad. I'm sure visually it works well. That's all that really matters. Uh, we use the measurements as a point of reference, but what's really going to matter is when I'm done, if it looks like it's supposed to. Maybe I'm ready to glue this down. I mean, there's a lot of wood to take off here, but when I'm on the bandsaw, I really feel like I'm kind of flying blind. I, I don't want to take off too much wood. That would be the worst thing. So, 
I think I'll glue this on and then start carving and filing this tomorrow. So if you've seen my video, Tommy's Tips, What Glue Do I Use? You know what I'm going to use because I'm going to use regular yellow carpenter's glue, tight bond. Uh, in any situation like this where you've got nice new wood, good clean joint, the strongest glue that you can use is regular carpenter's glue. So I'm just whittling away at the ankle here a little bit, thinking about exactly how I'm going to get this shape. And I think the first thing I want to do maybe is, is, is get this foot, the roundness of this foot from here out. And also uh, make sure that this is the right length and I'm at the right. So I, I put a piece of uh, MDF on the table saw and I'm going to stand this up on that and see if it sits uh, correctly. And so I'll, if it needs correction, I'll correct that first. And then I'll just go for this round right here. Yeah, sure enough, my, uh, my leg's a little long, so I'm glad I checked that at this point. i got to trim that. Now I'll, uh, I'll just hang this off the edge here and see if it, <laughs> and see if it matches my pencil line. Actually, pretty close to it. it. Maybe my pencil line is a little bit uh, short, but that's okay. I'll take off that much and we'll see where we're at. first time. All right, good. Now I can get back to this foot. All right, I feel pretty good. I've got a couple of reference points now. You know, before I sawed this off, I did punch my center mark here, so I still have my center mark here. So I've got, you know, this, this ankle as a reference point. I know that this now is the bottom of the foot. I've got a center mark. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reposition this desk uh, probably right here, so I have this leg at a 45 degree angle. I'm going to draw the outer circle here, my outer diameter of the foot, and form this circle as well as I can, exactly where it needs to be. Now I think I've got a, a, a pretty good cylinder here. It's starting to look like the foot. So I've got to identify now, I've got to strike two lines. There's a, a, a little pad that goes along the bottom, but I also want to strike the, the line that will represent the, the high point of this foot. So this little, this little pad looks to be uh, 
just about three sixteenths, maybe five thirty seconds, say. And the high point of the foot is about the half inch mark. I've got my lines marked, so now I can take away all this wood above this line, and I'll just kind of do this by eye for a while, uh, looking at the other feet as I go along. So I need to take off, you know, a lot more wood in here. I think I'm getting really uh, close now. Uh, in order to use my profile gauge anymore, I've got to start rounding over the top of this foot. I'm doing this round over and I think it's going fine, but I really need to start the other round over. I need to do the whole thing at the same time in order to see it. So it's time for me now to cut and shape this little pad that's on the bottom of the foot. try a carving tool. Looks like maybe I'm a little big still in this area here. This just doesn't want to go down. Not bad though. sandpaper I'm going to start with uh, 60 grit. Note how I still have my pencil line there. I got to keep that point and it's got to stay even. All that outside equator, so to speak, has to stay really level.
looks like a foot now. So all I got to do is sand it with uh, 100 and then 150. done. If you remember at the beginning of my video I mentioned that someone else is refinishing this desk. If you're curious about how to blend new wood to old wood, check out my video Glazing and Toning. When my job was just a carved foot, I think it looks pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorm, Maine. This is a very nice table. It's from the uh, postmodern studio furniture movement of the 1980s, uh, built by a uh, very well known artist, Wendy Mariama. Uh, she's an artist, furniture maker, and educator out of California. And uh, it's a very interesting table. It's got a lot of different elements. It, it does open up as a cabinet, it's a functional piece. You know, as you can see, different elements, different shapes, different treatments to the wood. Gold leaf, red leaf, fluorescent paint, but it's been damaged. Right down here, you see, it's been damaged by an animal. And uh, you can guess what kind of animal damaged it. I'll give you a hint, it's not a dog or a cat. So. That's what needs to be repaired. So what I want to do here is I want to get this up like this. I want to get the broken area into a, a horizontal position. And so I, I made a stand here off camera padded, see if that will work for me. This seems really secure. Now, I want to see if I can uh, jig this up so that I can use a router to give me a good surface. So I have a piece of plywood here with a hole cut out in the center and uh, I've cut some 2x4s and the plan is to uh, secure these to the bench over the repair area here and this will provide a platform for the router to uh, run on. This leg has movement, so I've got to clamp this a little more securely. I realize now I'm going to do this in two stages. I've been cutting the lower part of the leg here, uh, and it's you know it's nice and level, even though you need to go a little deeper there. But uh, the upper part of the break, I can go a lot shallower, so 
I'm going to do this in two or maybe even three stages. I finished up the first cut and now I got to switch to a shorter router bit. I'm going to step this up uh, even a third time. It will really minimize the amount of material I'm taking away. So I've been wondering this whole time what kind of wood this was. So I contacted uh, Wendy Mariama and she said it was gelatin, which is something I had not heard of. It's a wood from Southeast Asia, uh, very fine, fine-grained wood like basswood used a lot for carving, and she was kind enough to send me three pieces. So what I'm going to do is glue one layer at a time. I'll glue the first piece and then reroute it uh, to make sure I'm good and level with the second level and then the next piece and so on, the next piece. Okay, this is dried for about eight hours. And now I'm going to route this new piece down level with the next step. So I want to get this router bit set just slightly lower than my second step there. Okay, now I can glue down the next piece. Okay, now we uh, do it again. Okay, I can remove my whole uh, router setup now. I won't be using it anymore. Okay, now I got to shape this leg. Um, well, I'm going to start with, you know, cutting this flush with the foot here, and and then locating the foot itself. Now this. Uh, leg was originally bandsaw and I can't do that. But you know I've got a, a surface here, a, a facet of this leg I can follow down and the same on this side there's a facet here and I've, I'm just going to have to try to saw at that same angle uh, down to you know where this area in here it's so hard to say. Well let's try it. Now I've got to make sure I don't cut into my foot here. Foot's probably like this. So I just want to keep away from there. There's a lot of guesswork here. I'm going to err towards leaving too much wood there. So I'm looking at this facet. I'm just going to try to 
keep the saw at the same angle. Okay, this is good. I was a little too cautious, which is good. Now I can see more clearly how I've got to follow this facet down to about this point here. Okay, so far so good, but don't worry, I still got plenty of chances to screw up. Okay, I've cut this side now, and I think you can see that this facet right here goes all the way down to the bottom of the foot, so if I can follow this one here straight down to there, that'll be good. can draw a line, which will help. Now it's still heavy here, uh, which is good. Uh, maybe I can cut up and maintain this uh, angle right here. Okay, so now I'll follow the next facet down. I'm a little bit unsure what's going to happen here, but uh, I'll follow this down and see what happens. So far so good, I think. So now I think I'll follow this facet down. Starting to look like the leg now. Alright, I think I'm going to try to define this foot a little bit more at this point. Maybe I'll go with this facet now. And I've still got this little facet here. I 
think I'm going to switch to uh, a hand plane now. See if I can bring these in. See, I've got a high point here. Now I've still got some damage here. I'm going to fill that, those in with a water-based putty so I can wipe it off and not sand. So this texture was made with a, uh, in other words, this leg was shaped with a grinder with uh, heavy duty sandpaper on it. Now, I'm not going to attempt to use a grinder on this, so I'll just use a regular disc sander and see if I can just recreate that a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to sand with uh, 220. Uh, you know, even though it has tooling marks, it's uh, it's still pretty smooth. I think the only way I can uh, really see what I've got here is to go ahead and put some paint on it. Uh, you know, start trying to mix these colors anyway, and uh, I think then I'll really be able to see what my marks are like. Good. Well, it's hard to believe that uh, paint right out of the bottle would would look so good. I think I just need to keep applying, let this dry, and then apply more of it. Okay, I've let this dry for an hour. I'm going to give it uh, another coat here. Try to touch up some of these little spots.
I'm at the point now where I, I don't think I can get it any better. This may be it. I think the next step would be to uh, stand this up and have a look at it. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, I think I need to improve this area, at least attempt to improve this area here. I've got a little cut out there that I missed. That's what's good about putting it you know, back into position. I'm looking at it the correct way now. I think I could fool with this uh, endlessly and never really make it substantially better than it is now. Okay, I've got a uh, few touch-ups to do here and there, just uh, wear marks on some of these corners. Now let that dry and then uh, buff it a little bit. So when I came in this morning and looked at my repair area there, it looked great. And then of course, when I start looking at it closely, I can see the areas where I was having trouble blending it in. The reality is if you keep looking at this this close, you're never going to be satisfied with it. At a certain point, it's important to set it on the floor, stand back, and see what it looks like. So there you have it, a really nice, I guess a hall table. Uh, postmodern studio furniture, what a great example. It's uh, from 1990 by Wendy Mariama, and uh, obviously the, the leg had been damaged. And uh, sure enough, uh, on the floor here, standing here looking, standing back looking at it, it looks fine. I'm going to have to resist the temptation to quit, uh, to keep fooling with it while it's here in the shop. I'll be sweating bullets till my brother Greg sees this video. He's the only one that's really authorized to work on postmodern furniture, and uh, I hope he agrees. I think it looks pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gore, Maine. This is a nice antique card table. It's in process as you can see. I've been doing a lot of repair work to this apron. But this video will only concern itself with one aspect of this repair work. This table, because it has a flip top, has a swing leg to come out and support the top. And it's a wooden hinge, and that hinge, half of that hinge is broken. Let me show you. So this leg, if the hinge were all there, it swings out to support the top. But as you can see, half the hinge is broken, and so I need to repair it. It's becoming obvious that this piece is not going to come off of here very easy, but as I'm doing this, and struggling with this though, and studying this, I realize that I'm going to cut this, this piece of wood and with a half lap joint, add new wood. And I can do that without removing it from the base. This piece appears to be made out of uh, oak, 
kind of looks like probably white oak to me. And I've got a nice uh, piece here. I'm going to cut and mill up a piece of wood the same size as this piece. Okay, so now this will be my first attempt at cutting this knuckle joint here. I'm looking at it. I realized as I was looking at this, there's a, there's a bevel cut here that actually serves as the stop where the other leg meets it right there. And so I think the first thing I'm going to do, I believe it's identical to this one. It almost has to be. I'm going to measure back and I'm going to make that little 45. Yeah, I think that cut looks just about right. I realized as soon as I cut this on the router and it, it looked a little odd, I was getting ready to plane it down to complete my round over here. And then I realized uh, I made this board the same thickness as this board, which is 1 and 7 sixteenths. But this board is only 1 and 8 inches thick. And I realized that it sits like this, there's a space there. And so my, my knuckle here that I'm forming uh, really needs to conform to the one and an eighth inch diameter, not the diameter of the larger board. So I've got to make a saw kerf here and then uh, remove some wood here and then do the round over again. I want to cut out this wood here so that then I can complete that circle right there. So now my round over here, what will become my hinge, now it lines up a lot better with what I've got there. Okay, so I'm going to clean this up a little bit. I've got some planing to do to clean it up. Now I want to mark out my knuckles here, uh, the parts I want to cut away. Now I put a piece of scrap under here to bring this up level with the new piece. I want to make sure that these are aligned. This is the part I will remove. little defect there. I think I'm going to have to glue that down uh, before I proceed. Alright, I'll go make a cup of tea while I wait for this five minute epoxy to set up. You know, I'm concerned that I'm not going to get a great transfer of my marks here. I think I'm going to line this side up with the other side of the piece that it goes to. So this is the way I made these marks. So 
Now, before I go any further, I just want to have a look and first I got to drive this pin out. I think this, uh, I think this thing could work. I think what I want to do now is Clamp these aligned exactly the, the, the way they are supposed to be, and then I'm going to drill for that pin. Install the pin. And then finish shaping my knuckles down to match the other, the originals. All right, it actually works. Um, not great, but I can see that I need to uh, round over my knuckles to match the uh, old ones. They're bigger. I'm going to do that while it's in place here. That, then I think it's going to work fine. Even though I've got my knuckles, you know, shaped now pretty good. I can take a little more off there. Still having problems right here. And I began to realize that the old knuckles are binding into my new piece here. I, I think I have to cove out this area on my new piece. I looked at the, uh, the table and I think that's what I'm seeing there, because I'm getting a little bit of binding right at that point. Maybe I'll make it a little bigger, but I only need to take out just that little bit. Okay, now I've got this inside gouged out, and now with this out, I can see that these are a little oval shaped, uh, and I can round this over a little bit more. All right, now it works really well. Works really well now. All right, so now I've got my hinge. The next step is to cut this piece of wood and cut the corresponding piece on the table and glue it in where it belongs. I'll cut the old one first, cut my new piece to fit in. That's somewhat arbitrary, but it, it's going to give me a lot of glue surface. 
I'm going to tape off what I've marked here as a visual. This is the area of wood that I'm going to take away. I've clamped a, just a little routing jig onto the wood I need, you know, where I need to cut it away. I'm going to make a lot of uh, multiple light cuts, moving the jig down as I go along. That's uh, all the routing I can do for now. I've routed pretty good here. There's a little bit of wood I need to take out by hand. Okay, I think I've got a pretty good cutaway here. And so now, here's my new piece. I've got to cut it to fit in there. So I reconnected my new piece to the swing leg and I'm going to hold this here right where it belongs and see if I can't clamp this right into position. I think that's just about right. I can mark that out. I think the next step will be to uh, reconnect this to the, uh, the swing leg and see what it looks like. Boy, this looks, uh, this looks good. It looks like well, I might need to take a little bit off the end of that. Take this in. Yeah, it has to match this here. I need to go that way a little bit, which is great because i got a little space there. All right, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Well, it seems to uh, work well. Uh, I want to set it on the floor and see how it works. It actually works. So now I, I'm going to fill in my lousy joints here. Uh, sand this. I think I'll sand this entire surface. Okay, I've sanded everything down nice and level. I think the first thing I'll do is stain the new wood with some thinned out dye stain. Uh, see if I can get it to the basic color of the old wood here. Uh, it's, it's closer to the uh, old wood now. Uh, I'll let that dry and then I'll hit the whole thing with the oil stain. And in theory, all this wood in here doesn't show, but I'm going to just put some stain on it anyway, just in case. A little, I don't want the raw wood to show around the knuckles. Okay, I've let that dye stain uh, dry for a couple hours. Now I'm going to try some oil stain. I'll go over the whole thing. I have some raw umber oil stain, and um, I'm using that because it doesn't have any red in it. But my new piece of wood looks great. It's uh, too bad it just doesn't look like the old wood that well. There's still a lot of contrast. I think what I'm going to try to do is apply more of that oil stain, but uh, pat it and brush it very carefully and try to leave uh, some on the new wood. Okay, I've uh, 
I left quite a bit of stain on this new piece, trying to get it in the same darkness. Uh, it doesn't need to have any finish on it, but I'm actually going to seal it just with one coat of a Van Dyke Brown Amersol, uh, just to fix that stain so it doesn't rub off. Okay, I've let that aerosol lacquer dry. It's not really showing any build. Blends in pretty good, so now uh, I will assemble it. Now I've had this uh, pin in and out of here so many times, I'm going to staple across the bottom of it to make sure it doesn't fall out. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, assemble the rest of the table. I'm going to install the top, take the newspaper off the legs and uh, wax them up and it'll be done. Alright, here we go. We're all assembled. I put a piece of felt here to catch the top. I actually did a lot of uh, other work to this table. Of course, this video just shows the hinge repair. But, uh, it's ready to go. It looks pretty good. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, Please subscribe and like, and be sure to hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified when I put out a new video.